Hello and welcome to the Connections webinar series brought to you by the Master of Arts in Communication program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features a discussion with Chanel Ohan Crosby on communication in Asia. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's event will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Connections playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn the event over to our moderator, Dr. Patricia Hernandez, Assistant Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Arts in Communication program. Thank you, Peter, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm thrilled to have one of our alums who's coming to us from all the way from Singapore who has extensive experience in international communication with a specific focus on Asia. So I'm super excited to bring this aspect to the Connection series because we haven't had this yet. Uh, so without further ado, I'll let uh, Chanel go ahead and introduce herself and take it away. Hello everyone, uh, greetings from Singapore. So brief uh, introduction about myself. So I am currently based in Singapore, but I've been in Asia almost 10 years now. Um, so I graduated from the John Hopkins uh, program and I originally from Santa Barbara, California and lived in Shanghai from 2014 until 2019. Worked in e-commerce. Uh, I was the head of content for an e-commerce company owned by Essie Lore Exotica, which is a the top leader in lens, um, lenses in the world pretty much. Uh, and so I worked there, we're heading the content for a international team. Most of our market was for the US. And then we moved on to Singapore where um, I created my own company, uh, Joriana's Consulting, inspired by my children, Jonas and Oriana. And uh, there I worked with a variety of, of companies ranging from sustainability, to um, technology, to um, market entry, to the Chinese, uh, to the Chinese market. So a um, variety of clients from different parts of the world, uh, different cultural backgrounds and different experiences. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. And I welcome questions. Um, I will answer them as best as I can. Here are my slides. So I'm gonna to talk to you about communication in Asia. Uh, it's a brief overview because it is a very uh, extensive uh, sector. Um, Asia is of course a very big region and a very crucial one in terms of um, geopolitics, but here we're talking about communication. So um, we can go on to the next slide. So first question is why Asia? We're gonna go talk about why Asia is important. Take a closer look at China, which is a very interesting um, example of communication in Asia, and then Singapore. And then um, a point I wanna talk about is the value of English in Asia. We can go to the next slide. Why Asia? So as you can see here, we have a container ship. Why is a container ship important to China and Singapore? So as you know, China is the biggest, a big manufacturer, right? They ship out tons and tons of stuff every year to all over the world through container ships. And Singapore is actually a key between Asia and China because since its founding, since before it was the modern Singapore, um, it was a strategic place because the water is extremely deep in Singapore. It's actually an island. And if you wanted to find Singapore, which people are trying to get away from, is actually, it is a port city. And so you will see an enormous, enormous port in Singapore. So we can go to the next slide. So I brought up a little map of um, Shanghai, China, and Singapore. So you can see Shanghai, that's about a five, six, six hour flight. So a little bit more or less um, LA, uh, DC flight. Um, but remember when you're crossing Asia, you're going through a lot of countries to get there. So China is a very big country as we know. Shanghai is uh, international capital in terms of business in terms of international. I'm all talking about this pre-COVID because I was there from 2014 to 2019. So when I'm speaking, I'm speaking about my experience pre-COVID. Um, 
And then Singapore, you can barely see it's at the bottom. It's, we call it the little red dot. And it's a tiny little island, a little bit more than 5 million people, surrounded by water, but small but mighty. Uh, financial sector, technology. I mean, they, they've made in uh, just a few years, less than 100 years, okay? They've made it into a in international capital, and now it's kind of replacing Hong Kong as a center, as Hong Kong is moving away from, um, as China is getting more of a control over Hong Kong. So um, we can go to the next slide. So we're going to take a closer look at China. This is Shanghai. Uh, if you ever look at pictures of Shanghai, you'll see this island, uh, the the other side of uh, the Shanghai city, which is uh, Pudong, um, which means the, the, the east side. And uh, as you can see, super modern buildings, super, I mean, they build at a speed that is incredible. So we can go to the, the next slide. So one thing I want to talk about is when you're learning about communication in the U.S. or in Europe, you're, there's pretty much freedom, freedom of what you want to say. Obviously, every freedom has its consequences, but, but government regulation is a big deal in China. Now, this is not, this isn't news to anyone, I'm assuming, um, but it is a very important part in knowing how China becomes a trendsetter in the rest of the world. So Facebook, WhatsApp, Google, X or Twitter, however you want to call it, LinkedIn and Instagram are blocked by the government in China. This means that if you go online and you go, you Google Facebook, you Google WhatsApp, you Google you Google Google, you can't even Google. Um, you, you, you do a search on your search engine and you wanna use any of these platforms, you can't, it will be blocked because they're afraid of people finding out too much. Um, they wanna control what their people know. And so these things are blocked. However, we have this fancy Nancy thing called a VPN. And if you are working in China or, and living in China, you use a VPN. VPNs can counter that. So you can use Facebook and you can use all these things. They can be a little bit spotty at times, but a lot of people use them, even in work. A lot of, my, I mean, in my workplace, I used it every day. And um, so that being said, so we have all these things that are blocked. So what do you do? How do, how do the Chinese communicate? How do they get their messages? How do they do their marketing? So they're smart. They replace all the platforms with their own. So everything is made in China. So you want, if you want full control, you create your own platforms. So you have WeChat, which I'll talk about later, which is an, the super app. It's incredible. Um, we're talking this 10 years ago. Okay, so this is pretty impressive. Why not? I'm gonna explain it to you. Uh, Douyin, which is the TikTok. So TikTok is Chinese, uh, but the version that is used in China is their own version. So the one that you're using abroad is a different version of TikTok. It's, it's still the same company, but it is a different, um, it's a more international version. And there's Weibo. Weibo is, uh, is kind of like a Twitter. I never really used it in China that much because it wasn't as popular, but it's still out there. And so the main question we want to ask ourselves is in a country where information is tightly controlled by the authorities, delivering the right message to the right audience is fundamental. So despite all these restrictions, you're living in this world where this country, where these, these are your options. And so how do you use these to get your message across to your customer, to your company, to, the, to your shareholders, whatever. This is a platform that people use. These are the platforms people use. So government censorship plays a huge role in, in, the, in the communication strategy in China. So we can go on to the next slide. So the ultimate app, WeChat. So looking, thinking back 10 years ago, it seems like not much. So we'll say like 2014, 2013, 2012. WeChat came to, to light and it's been constantly improving. So to describe WeChat, I would say it's a cross between WhatsApp meets Facebook meets Instagram, all rolled into one with so many more options. So you have text messaging, hold to talk voice messaging. You can see this now on WhatsApp, group messaging, video calls, video games, mobile payment. So instant payment, this is all in one app. So you have your credit card um, connected and you can just 
send a payment. You go shopping. Oh, I need to reimburse you. Here's the money. Da -da -da. Done. Super efficient uh, and immediate. And the, since the banking system in China back 10 years ago, we're say, was kind of complicated, this was a great way for people to make payments. And you know, you have QR codes, so it's super easy, super fast, and it, it revolutionized your daily life. There's also sharing photographs and videos, which is pretty standard. Location sharing, so you see that on WhatsApp um, now, um, and immediate translation of messages. So for example, uh, my young daughter, um, so I was working, I had a nanny, and she only spoke Mandarin. And my Mandarin is, at the time, was, was okay, but it wasn't enough to have enough vocabulary to tell her complicated things. So I would write in English on the WeChat app, and our nanny, Xiaohua, would respond in English. Well, she didn't speak a word of English, but she had an app. Uh, she had WeChat help her write her messages. So we would commun we were able to communicate perfectly. It was incredible. And a lot of things like that happened. I could get messages in it where that I couldn't read and I would press the, the message and it would just translate into English. I mean, it's not always perfect translation, uh, but it's pretty great. Uh, one day, um, Xiaohua sent me a message and I think there was an issue with the translation because she said to me, she sent me a message saying, I want to eat your daughter. And I said, wow, I don't, I don't think you want to eat my daughter. So I, I sent her a message back and I said, this is what you wrote. And she said, oh no, I didn't write that. I wrote something else. Um, I think it was, does your want or want, daughter want to eat? But anyways, so lost in translation. Uh, although I did learn Mandarin to a certain extent, I was learning taking classes. It is... It is uh, reading Mandarin can take a, many years. Um, speaking it, it's, it's much more straightforward. But in terms of mastering a language in a short amount of time, it's, you need these things to help you get through it. So we can go to the next slide. I think there was one before. There we go. OK. so. We have this super app, okay? So this is the example I'm going with is WeChat. How does it work? So I took a few screenshots of my phone. I protect the innocent by erasing some names and information. Uh, so here on the far left, you can see there's a contact list. So you have all your contacts, just like on a WhatsApp or any other app you use. Then you have chats, right? So Everybody kind of knows what, how that works. You know, you have group chats or your personal chats. And then you have moments. So moments are kind of, I would say, a combination of Facebook and Instagram. So people post their picture and a little note about what's going on and the video, whatever they want. So it's, it's kind of like a social media wall. The thing is, we're talking 10 years ago, uh, you go to work. And people communicate a lot with WeChat. So they try to come up with a business version. I don't know whatever came of that. But what happens is people communicate all the time with it. So you end up by exchanging information with your colleagues. So you're working and you exchange. Someone says, oh, can I have your WeChat? And you say, okay. And then you realize that all your personal stuff, is they're going to have full access to it. So it's kind of funny because you, feel, you see what people post. And... So in Shanghai, uh, it's heavily polluted. And so you don't see the, a bright blue sky very often. And when you do, it's, it's a big deal. It's as if a rock star came to your, your city. So you'll look on moments. And what do you see? Just pictures of a blue sky. People will post that. You keep looking. You're thinking, okay, people are posting. Up. No, no, no. Blue sky. Blue sky. Blue sky. And, and that's all you see. <laughs> so those were what we considered events. And it does tell you, it does help to figure out what's going on. The problem is, is that because these are all censored, you have to be careful what you're posting. So when it comes to political stuff, um, if there's anything related to China's views on things, you have to be careful. We can go to the next slide. So 
I said before, so what happens is social and professional become intertwined, right? Because you're using the same app, people have access to your personal stuff. And, but, the, but overall, I never felt that the Chinese were very concerned with that. Um, they seemed very okay with that. I think uh, I see a lot in the West, like we're more concerned about sharing our, our personal lives with our professional lives. But in, in China, it didn't seem to be an issue when I was working there. So businesses are present on WeChat. So if you see that your whole public is using this app, you're going to want to, you're going to want in on it, right? So um, you have uh, moments, you have um, official accounts. So official accounts are, let's say you really love Gucci. You just love that Gucci. So you're going to have messages from Gucci telling you, this is what we're doing. We just launched our new bag. You're going to be getting information from the brands you like. And the Chinese are very brand oriented. So they're gonna, they're, they're pretty faithful to their brands. They really want to know what's going on. So they will get, they will like having, even if that Gucci bag, they're gonna buy it in a year, they're going to wanna know about it. So, um, so you can see on the far right, this is an ad for a, actually a French chocolate brand that launched in China. And they did an ad here uh, as you can see, it's bright, it's colorful. Um, there's a little card at the bottom. You can see that people can interact with it. So businesses have to be present on WeChat. So it is, a, I would say, a, the ultimate app. We can go to the next page. So WeChat has transformed communication in China. It is owned by Tencent, which is a Chinese company. Uh, it, has a presence in the US, other parts of the world as well. It is a big company that owns this. Um, so there's different aspects. So I talked about advertising, official accounts, social media, easy payment. Customer service also goes through WeChat and group buying. So group buying uh, is interesting. You get, you get other people to buy with you the same product to get a deal, for example. So for example, during COVID, this is interesting. So Lockdown in China was ultimate. So you could not leave your house. You could not, okay? Very, very few people were able to leave their houses during lockdown. So what people would do in these, you know, you have to realize that one building can be a lot of people. China is very populated. So you're in your condo building and someone says, hey, let's buy McDonald's tonight. Well, one person can't get it delivered. Yes, you can get it delivered in China and in Singapore, you want to get that McDonald's. You want, so you start, so there would be WeChat groups in buildings that would say, let's buy McDonald's, let's do a group buy. And so, so the McDonald's would say, we need a minimum, let's say of $2,000, okay? You get a whole condo to buy McDonald's and then McDonald's would deliver. So this is during COVID. Post COVID though, or pre COVID, you can still order McDonald's for you know, ten dollars, but the delivery, the the another concept that not related to communication, but to realize is that in Asia, delivery is cheap, so you can have things delivered constantly for a very low price. So um, we can go on to the next slide. So being such a big country and such an innovative country. China is the trendsetter in the region when it comes to communication. They, they come up with these apps. I mean, TikTok is an example of how it's gone worldwide. Uh, I wonder how many people actually know it's Chinese. Um, so we have this thing where business and personal are merged, right? I, I mean, we've, we saw how, I mean, even Facebook, you know, it was personal, then, then we started having pages, business pages, it evolved, right? All these platforms evolve, they have to, right? Because the needs of the customers change, the needs of the of people change. And another phenomenon I wanna talk about is how shopping is a social experience, both online and offline. So what's happening now in Asia, and we'll see it coming to us soon, I believe, is that shopping is not just about going in, buying something and leaving online. So when it comes to what 
all the new platforms are doing now for um, e-commerce platforms in China is they're making it a full experience. They don't want their customers to just come like an on Amazon, which is flat, buy and leave. They're making them get involved. They're putting KOLs, uh, alternative reality, 3D. They're making it a full, full experience. And they want you to be fully connected with the product and to fully experience it. Amazon, on the other hand, is an example of, an, of, a, of a platform where you go in, you buy, and you leave. I actually like that because <laughs> I don't have time for games. So there's an app. There's a, and so it's not trying to communicate more with you. It's just saying, here, buy, and then you'll get maybe some ads, and that's it. And uh, there are companies now that are bringing this new approach to Europe. Um, so I worked for a company like this, one of my clients, uh, Sesame, like Open Sesame. Uh, they, uh, they're they doing this. They're finding clients in Europe who want to follow this business model. And I, I you will see changes, I think. It's probably already happening. Where e-commerce, they're trying to get people to buy more and they're trying to, co to stay connected to their consumers. So uh, we can go on to the next slide. So this is where I live now. No, I do not live in those gorgeous towers. Um, and this is Singapore. So Singapore, the little red dot. So what's pretty cool about Singapore, um, uh, so the pretty cool thing about Singapore is that Singapore is, as I said before, an island of five, over five million people. It was nothing, it was jungle. It was pretty much a jungle, um, but its port was very interesting to um, to the British Empire, and so it became a strategic um, area for for commerce. So, where this this is an innovative country, and but very has very set rules. Not like it's different than China, but it has very set rules. So you can see all of this is actually reclaimed land. There was no land there; it was just water because there's not enough space, right? Because we're talking about an island here. So contrary to Hong Kong, which you may have heard about, uh, Hong Kong is, there's not as much land. So it, people are kind of on top of each other, but Singapore is a little bit more spread out. It's very green. People call it the garden city. So um, we can go on and move to the next slide. So cultural considerations in Singapore. So just a little bit about Singapore because um, it is a little place and not everybody knows about it, but it is a mighty, mighty place. So um, the population is most, uh, is so we say, we call them Singaporeans. And um, a lot of them are ethnically Chinese coming in from, uh, can, uh, so Guangdong, um, Xiamen, Fujian. So kind of more the, more the Southern part of China. Um, and they, uh, they came for better opportunities uh, to work. They came to Singapore. And so the majority of the population in Singapore is of, of Chinese descent. Then you have a smaller population of Malay. So those are the people originally, um, so the people of, um, so um, that's a, a group. And then t the, the Tamil. So the Malay would you would associate with Malaysia and Tamil um, India. So it's a very diverse um, country. So you actually have um, holidays, you have Indian holidays, Christian holidays, Chinese holidays, and Muslim holidays. So it's very diverse. It's very nice. Uh, it's, uh, they just really celebrate this cultural diversity. And on top of it, we have some expats, including me. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's very nice in terms of culture. Uh, the primary language is English, but the official languages are Mandarin, Tamil, Malay, um, and of course English. Um, that being said, pe most people speak a lot of different languages. So there's, um, you'll have Hokkien, Cantonese, you'll have a lot of different um, languages that are kind of similar to Mandarin. Um, and what happens is people are using so many different languages that it kind of takes a toll on the daily English. So sometimes you'll notice the composition of people's sentences. 
sound almost as if they were coming from Chinese. So um, it's, it's interesting. It's very, um, and um, so English is taught as a day-to-day -day thing, but it, it is, it is sometimes, uh, sometimes people don't speak it very well. And they're on top of it, they have something called Singlish, which is really, really fun. It's kind of a combination of English with multiple of these um, Asian languages. And so um, what they do is they add up a lot of las. So instead of saying, okay, you would say, okay, la. And so my kids love doing that. My son says to people, thank you, la. So, um, and the Singaporeans have a good sense of humor about it because they embrace it as part of their culture. So as I said, um, Singapore is a little red dot. It is a small place um, and uh, it's a city state. So it is, if you say you're from Singapore, you say you're from Singapore, Singapore. There's no state, there's no other thing to add. So um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so digital communication trends. So Singapore, unlike China, is very much, has still very much the Western influence in terms of communication. It is at the crossroads of Asia and the West. Uh, it takes a lot of practices from the West. In its development, it did have a lot of, uh, you know, it, it had the, the, the British influence. It has the, the, Malay, the Malaysian influence because they're, they used to be part of Malaysia. Uh, they have, so they're in Southeast Asia, but they also have that kind of attachment to China because of a lot of them are, are, there's a lot of cultural connection to China. So in terms of communication, you're dealing with a lot of cultures and a lot of, um, a lot of diversity, but you're also dealing with things you would recognize. So people are using Facebook, they're using Google, they're using uh, all the platforms out there that exist. Um, I asked the other day out of randomly someone, do you ever use WeChat? And they, most people are like, what? We never use that. So there's not, there's not censorship like in China. There are rules though that need to be followed in Singapore. So you can't talk, say bad things about the government or the, um, the prime minister. You have to be careful um, about what you say in those terms. But most of all, you can read the press. It's pretty open. Um, and so they are, so when it comes to day to day, I would say that it, if you could jump into an office here and you tried to do a lot of, um, use a lot of things that you were using, let's say in the U S I don't think you would be totally lost. Um, China, on the other hand, you would have, you would have a learning curve. So, um, we can go on to the next slide. So the value of English in Asia. So when you come into when you come into um, Asia, you're thinking, okay, I'm living in China now. I need to learn Mandarin. I need to get jobs. How am I going to do this? Well, to my surprise, actually, English was much needed. Uh, despite Mandarin being essential to my day to day life and to connecting with my colleagues, it. Is, it was extremely important when it came to international business. The, at the time when I was living in uh, China, it was, it, was, uh, it was important to have my English became very, being a native English speaker was actually very important. What happened was I got hired based on that in all the companies I worked for because they wanted native English speakers, their market was primarily American or primarily uh, English speaking. And they needed someone who wrote like an American, wrote like an English speaker, a native English speaker, because despite, despite being an important uh, part of the business world, they need to be able to reach out. And a lot of them, their English was not good enough, but you'd be surprised by how many Chinese, how many Chinese people speak pretty decent English as well. So that actually helped me a lot when I was working um, in China. And then coming to Singapore, people still look for native English speakers. Um, they want the style of writing. Um, 
Singapore puts a, a big emphasis on math and science. Uh, so sometimes it's harder to find writers um, or people in the communication field that are um, interested in that. So, um, so yeah, we can go on to the next slide. So this is something most people may not experience in the day to day when they're working in this sector. Um, when you're living, when you're living and working abroad, there is a sensitivity that you have to constantly be aware of. So the diplomatic communication with clients is extremely important. I've worked with people who were Chinese, who were French, who were all different backgrounds. And you have to be sensitive to the fact that you're working, that English isn't their first language, that they're highly accomplished. So you're not, you know, you can't just tell them what to do and say, you know, I'm writing this, I'm doing this, I'm communicating this way, I'm, I'm putting out messages this way. You, you really need to think about that they kind of know what they want. And they can be easily offended. You know, I once made a mistake and luckily we worked it out, but when I overcorrected someone's uh, piece and she didn't appreciate it. So it's, it, you have to be very careful, very careful. Um, because people, you know, they, this is their work. This is their company. This is what they stand for. So I always, there's, I learned from my mistakes, obviously. And I asked, started asking my clients when I was doing proofreading or fixing articles or fixing any of their communication pieces, I would ask them, well, how, how far do you want me to go? How in depth do you really want me to rewrite this? Do you want me to uh, proofread lightly? And then I realized that some people think their English is super good. <laughs> and so you have to respect that. You say, okay, they, this is the head of the company. I'm going to help her with this, but I have to be careful. And so you respect their writing. You want to, you ask them, how deep do you want me to go? How, how much do you, do you want me to help you? And that helped a lot. And I had, I had people who wanted me to really help them so much. And then people who just wanted a little bit. And so knowing how to step back, knowing how to say, okay, I'm not the best. I'm not the brightest. I don't know everything. It's very important to, to, to be sensitive. And um, that was one of the best, um, one, that was one of the best uh, uh, ways to go about this. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. So I'm onto this questions page, um, those questions. Um, so I'm open to uh, any questions from anyone. I will do my best to answer them. If I'm not the expert on the subject, I will tell you. So um, thank you. Um, for this, for letting me speak to you about this. It's been a pleasure and uh, I'll move it on to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I with, I appreciate uh, your you know overview and sharing your experience based on your time there. Uh, I would say, what advice would you have for anyone that is looking to do you know, to do communication abroad or even working here in the U.S. with companies, you know, when you're working with companies in China or Singapore or other places in Asia? Um, well, um, so there's one aspect that's very important culturally uh, when, with the, when it comes to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. They like to say yes, but yes mm -hmm. doesn't mean yes. Right. So, uh, <laughs> um you know, I mean, I hear as an American always comments about uh, Americans when I'm living abroad, you know, so, you know, mm -hmm. everybody has their, I guess their, their way of working. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's a big thing in Asia about saving face. This is a very, very ex ex um, important uh, thing to know is that um, even if someone's doing something wrong, you don't want to humiliate them. You need to be respectful uh, you don't want, like, if you come to a meeting and you know the person you're negotiating with or, or you're working with didn't do their work, you don't want to humiliate them. And so this saving face um, is very, very important. And you see it also in Singapore, but Singapore is more international. So you don't, you don't always see it as, 
Um, but the Chinese, it's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. The yes factor is um, something you have to get past. Uh, my husband's been working in China many years and he always comes across it. So um, uh, yes, yes, kui, kui. it's really like you have to get past that. You have to talk past it. Okay, sure. So you can do that. Well, then you try to develop on that. So I remember sometimes I would deal with this with people. They were like, oh, can you do this? Yes. And they're like, so, so then I would develop on that. So do you mean da 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 and da 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 And I'd make them answer with more than a yes. Mm -hmm. So then that helps develop um, better understanding mm -hmm. um, and being patient. And in China, for example, doing business is very social. You have mm -hmm. dinners that last hours where they make you eat and they make you drink. And it's a big part of signing deals. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be patient. I mean, <laughs> my husband has had quite a many deals and it's in there super welcoming. I mean, I, and have a great sense of humor. I mm -hmm. mean, you can share a laugh with someone on the street. You, you don't know, and you don't even speak to each other. So mm -hmm. that's enjoyable. Um, to develop on more so that I don't know if I answered all the questions, but uh, and Singapore is more easy because it's it's mm -hmm. it's an easier place to jump in because mm -hmm. it's super international. People already speak English. Uh, you just have to know how to adapt culturally, um, mm -hmm. and it's a more rigid structure, mm -hmm. unlike the Chinese where they're a little bit more flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have so corporate a corporate environment would really be a corporate environment. Um, they really like structure and. And uh, so I think it's easier to probably jump in, in in Singapore than it would be in China. And you said you you started your own consulting firm. And mm -hmm. I know I'm sure you're familiar here in D.C. The joke is everyone's a consultant and no one knows what the hell anyone does. So can you describe like describe some of your projects that you actually you know consult on and what that looks like? And, and especially you yes. know, doing it in another country. Yeah. And. Everybody has a startup too. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I actually fell into it because I in China, I was doing a lot of, uh, based on my background in communication and the fact that I was a native English speaker, I saw that there was a great need for my services. Mm -hmm. So when I arrived in Singapore, after getting over that whole COVID thing, mm -hmm. um, as Singapore was opening up, because we were pretty restricted for a while, Mm -hmm. uh, I pretty much fell into it because I was looking for jobs and it was really bad here. So I created my own company and my clients ended up being from a variety of sectors. So I had clients I had worked with in China uh, do mar doing market entry. So this is very interesting. So for example, you have a company like Nike that wants to go into China, mm -hmm. but it's not just about selling products. They want to know, like in the US, you would go to a Nike website but in China, you would have one platform with multi mini websites inside. And because Nike, would, I'm using this as an example, this, is, this didn't actually happen. <laughs> um, Nike would, let's say, contact this company and the company would say, okay, this is what you need to do for the Chinese market to enter the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. So for them, it was a lot of communication. They needed a native English speaker of how to communicate with, with um, English speaking brands. But mm -hmm. what's surprising is that even French brands or other European brands, they were communicating English. Mm -hmm. English is, I realize this coming into Asia, is that English is such a crucial language in the business world. Uh, and so I think we're pretty, we're, we're pretty lucky that we speak it. Um, and so you see that on a day-to-day, -day, you have people where it's their second language, as I said, highly accomplished, but they just have a harder time mm -hmm. um, getting their ideas across. So I... I, that was one example. I worked for um, really cool initiatives right now in the world with sustainability. So a company mm -hmm. that was doing su uh, sustainability um, technology for small uh, companies. So I was helping with their website, getting their ideas across, uh, putting all their content together. Um, then there was other, uh, the market entry firm I did, I did some other stuff for them like LinkedIn uh, so social media, um, but uh, all respecting everything was very corporate oriented. They did not want, you know. Um, but interestingly enough, the style of writing became a little bit more upbeat, a little bit more casual mm -hmm. as the time went. So interesting to see how things evolve. And uh, I worked for also for DFS, which is um, if you ever go into airports, there's all those duty free stores. Mm -hmm. 
and they're all run by one company. So mm -hmm. there's different companies that exist. One of them is um, DFS owned by the LVM LVMH group, which is Louis Vuitton and all that's a huge group, mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. group. So I help with their internal communication. They had to do some internal communication. I had to keep that under wraps. Nothing mm -hmm. very secretive, but for them, <laughs> it, they didn't want to advertise it. Right. So on their so I had to learn about technology then because it was the technology mm -hmm. sector of the company. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the tech um, department. Mm -hmm. So I would say when you're looking to work in Asia, flexibility is key. Um, being able to adapt, being able to learn on the job. I think everywhere in the world you have to do that, but Asia is moving always very fast. I think it's a faster pace in terms of movement of ideas, of things. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what attracted me to China. When uh, when I arrived there the first time, it was so exciting. Mm -hmm. um, it was less structured. It was less, you know, it, it was it was an interesting uh, experience and it was exciting. And it was unknown. And I actually met my husband there. And, you know, we, we got married there. Yeah. <laughs> Tried planning a whole wedding with Chinese, um, um, in Chinese, pretty uh -huh. much. So <laughs> that was quite the experience. So, yeah, yeah I would say flexibility is key. Flexibility mm -hmm. and open, being open-minded. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you stumble on anything, people are pretty forgiving. In China, mm -hmm. for example, like... If you make a faux pas in terms of culture, um, they 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 know you're like, oh, it's okay, you're you're a foreigner, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a few uh, questions. Uh, yeah, so, sure. Uh, Alexandra asks, oh, first said thank you for the informative presentation. Uh, as an alumna of the MA in communication program, what is something you learned in your studies that you currently utilize in your work slash career? Um, I would say I really like the course on crisis communication. When I learned about, um, I love that course, and I've actually advised some people based on what I learned in that course. Um, for example, I had a, I have, I have a friend working for a, um, a, a childcare facility, like um, in corporate, and there was a food poisoning incident. Mm -hmm. It happens. It happens. It wasn't, you know, you can't control everything. And I told them, I was like thinking in my mind, what did I learn? And I like, I, I, we were having lunch when this happened. And I was like, you need uh, to do this, 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 this. And then he's, he called up his uh, PR agency. Yeah. And they, that's exactly what they told him to do. <laughs> so <I was> like, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> that's great to hear. So you never know. And I, I still have my books on the shelf. I mean, they, they do get some of them need updating maybe, but yeah, they yeah. do come in handy. Good. And then uh, Peter asks, He's curious if you think a super app like WeChat will develop in the U.S. Um, so super app, I would say no, because uh, I think we are already doing that a little bit with WhatsApp. WhatsApp has kind of been taking on a lot of things WeChat does. Maybe to a certain extent, but I don't think uh, in terms of privacy controls, government controls, people really want that to happen. Because I think what makes WeChat possible is the fact that it's it's censored. So when there's any kind of protest or anything, um, if you start writing on the WeChat app, things will get blocked. But what people were doing, the Chinese were doing, they were taking pictures of things. And it's harder to censor pictures. So I personally think there may be a version of it, but never a super app version of it. That's my personal view, because I don't think... Uh, I don't think for, in terms of sensitivity of personal information, people would want that. Mm -hmm. And then going back to, I put it in the chat earlier mm -hmm. because I knew I was going to forget. Uh, so you talked about Amazon. I'm, I'm like you, like, I just want my, I know what I want. I'm going to purchase on Amazon and I don't want to, I don't want to engage any other discussion or mm -hmm. I don't need to have a relationship with any company. Like just give me my goods and the next day delivery for free. <laughs> uh, so why do you think, that model works with Amazon and not particularly the same in China. Um, so there's there's a geographical issue as well. So, okay, so the products in China can be super cheap. Mm -hmm. There's something called Taobao. Taobao was, um, now you see it under the version of Alibaba. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so you have 
a huge population. A lot of people are isolated because the not everybody has access to the same products everywhere. So it's mm -hmm. super important, right? But stores are constantly created every day. So, you know, they have a lot of fake stuff. So pe the stores are always taking them down, but they keep creating. Mm -hmm. um, so you, especially during COVID, people um, were buying even more, right? And mm -hmm. it's it's the habit hasn't gone away. And so I think the Chinese really like that. They like being interacted. They like the games. They like video games. I mean, you go in, in China, you'll find whole rooms full of people playing video games. It's, it's a totally normal thing you find in malls mm -hmm. in China. So people like the interaction. They mm -hmm. like the, I don't think we don't, I think we like it as well. I think it'll, it'll come here as well, uh, come to the West as well. Um, so I think that model works for Asia and I think it will work elsewhere as well. Um, and I think they're just ahead on that. They were just ahead. I mean, I think if it came out of the US, it, we would have, you know, it would have come that way as well. It, it could have worked both ways. Okay. I think it's just who got the technology first. Uh, Gabrielle asked, uh, or mm -hmm. first said, thank you for sharing. Uh, what made you want to go international with your career? Um, I don't think I had a choice. So, uh, so I was born in California. I have an international family. You can take the globe and spin it. And there's a few places you'll, <laughs> you can go uh, where I have family. Uh, and I always, I always love that. All my friends in the U.S., a lot of them were had like international backgrounds or they came from different places. I was always attracted to that. I, I was brought up that way. I spoke French. I was, I've always been bilingual in French and English. Did a stint at the UN for uh, during my time at UCLA. So it's kind of ingrained in me. And when I did go to China, for me, it was maybe a year or so and ended up by finding the love of my life. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> Uh, and then Lacey said uh, she, that they've enjoyed learning about your career and endeavors and thank you for your time. Uh, do you feel that international industries are more intentional of their mass communication efforts? If so, how? Good question. Uh, I would say in China, yes, maybe because they are, you're dealing with the enormous population. Uh, and I think it's more predictable maybe in the, you know, you always have customer, uh, profiles, right? Mm -hmm. You have customer profiles. And I think, I mean, there's a huge gap, uh, in China. I mean, you can go, I've been to places where they don't have running water, you mm -hmm. know, and then you go to places where they have gold bathtubs, you know, the, 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 the gap is enormous. Mm -hmm. And so you're, I think it's because you're controlling what's, I mean, in terms of advertising, there's not much control, but when you're dealing with, um, I think people just assume that people will mold to what they want. Like, like contrary to, I would, I don't know, this is my percep perception, but in the U S like, they'll be like, okay, we need to figure out what the customer really, really wants. Mm -hmm. But I feel like in, in China, for example, they're saying, no, this is what you want. This is what mm -hmm. you want. You want this. We're going to make you want this. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and it's interesting. It's interesting because I feel like there's a, an approach to that. Like, okay, you can't find out on your own what, what you want because you can't access the rest of uh, mm -hmm. the media, but we mm -hmm. will provide this for you. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like it's more that direction. Mm -hmm. Um. In terms of, uh, I, I'm not saying that for Singapore, I'm saying this for China specifically. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Or do you have any final comments that you want to give? I don't know, I thought I was gonna get tough, tough one. But... <laughs> um, I would say one thing to keep your eye on if you're watching the news or trends is to see how China will, China's now in a very different spot. Um, not just uh, politically, there's been movement, but also uh, in terms of business, there's a high unemployment rate now um, among uh, the, uh, the younger population um, to the point where parents are hiring their children to work for them. Uh, so keep an eye on that because this could, this could change in terms of uh, the approach China does to certain things. 
it'd be interesting to see how that develops in terms of buying power of what do they come up with to get people to buy more when the economy isn't doing so well. Um, so keep an eye. And obviously the numbers, when you look at the numbers that China publishes, they're not always 100% accurate. So just be aware of that. <laughs> um, don't send this out in China, please. <laughs> but um, I could say a lot of just, things about uh, that, but I will refrain. We're being recorded. <laughs> yes. Um, but this is a perception of just to be aware that it's a very interesting country. There is a lot of diversity in the country. Contrary to what people think, it's not just what you see in Shanghai and Beijing. You, I mean, my husband has a hat collection that is incredible, and most of it's from China. And the, the ethnic minorities have their own role. I mean, there's a lot of different different aspects to it. So in terms of communication, I would definitely keep an eye on how China takes on these next five years. Uh, and Singapore, it's an interesting place. If you ever make it to Southeast Asia, they have direct flights. The longest one is from New York, 19 hours, nonstop. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And feel Appreciate free to ask any more questions. Yeah, I appreciate your time. And I left my email. Okay, perfect, great. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Uh, and I don't know, Peter, I know we have one coming. Is it next week, Peter? <laughs> no, next month. I don't know. Next month. <laughs> we have it uh, on December 5th. We have our next yeah, connections next event. Month. Next week, next month, same thing. <laughs> same thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but again, appreciate you all for showing up and thank you Chanel for your time and uh and sharing your experience mm -hmm. a pleasure all right thank you <laughs> bye